Καλησπέρα σας, κυρίες και κύριοι. Είμαι η Bonner Westcott, διευθύντρια της Αμερικανικής Σκολής Κλασικών Σπουδών στην Αθήνα. Με μεγάλη μου χαρά σας καλωσορίζω εδώ απόψε για την πέμπτη διαλεξή μας για την κλασική αρχαιολογία και την ιστορία της τέχνης. Η ομιλητριά μας απόψη είναι, είναι η διακεκριμένη μελετήτρια Sarah Morris, καθηγήτρια κλασικής αρχαιολογίας και υλικού πολιτισμού Steinmetz στο Τμήμα Κλασικών Σπουδών και στο Ινστιτούτο Αρχαιολογίας Κότσεν στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Καλιφόρνιας στο Λος Άγγελις. Η ερευνά της έχει ευρύ ορίζοντα. Όλα τα χρόνια έχουμε θαυμάσει τον, τον, τον τρόπο που πάντρεψε την αρχαιολο, αρχαι, αρχαία λογοτεχνία και τον υλικό πολιτισμό σε όλη την Ανατολική Μεσόγειο για να εξερευνήσει την διαμόρφωση των αρχαιών κοινωνιών. Αυτή έχει εκπαίδρευση γενιές φοιτητών οι οποίοι τώρα με την σειρά τους συνεισφέρουν σε διάφορους κλάδους. Έχει μια εξαιρετική εμπειρία επιτόπιας έρευνας στο Ισραήλ, στην Τουρκία, στην Αλβανία και στην Ελλάδα. Πιο πρόσφατα ως συνδιευθύντρια του αρχαιολογικού έργου Αρχαίας Μεθόνης, μιας συνεργασίας με την εφορία Πιερίας. Οπόψη μοιράζεται α, α, μαζί μας την θεωρησή της για την Αρχαία Μεθόνη, με επίκεντρο τις πολλές ιστορίες που δημιουργούν οι διά, διάφοροι πληθυσμοί της. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bonna Westcote, director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. It is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our fifth lecture on classical archaeology and art history. Our speaker this evening is the distinguished scholar Sarah Morris, Steinmetz Professor of Classical Archaeology and Material Culture in the Department of Classics and Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research has a broad horizon. Over the years, we have admired the way she has joined literature and material culture across the Eastern Mediterranean to explore the making of ancient societies. She has trained generations of students who now are important co contributors in several fields. She has an extraordinary range of fieldwork experience in Israel, Turkey, Albania, and Greece most recently as co-director of the Ancient Methoni Archaeological Project, a synergasia in the effort of, of Piria, uh, Piria. Tonight, she shares with us her ancient view of Methoni, her, her, not her ancient view, her view of ancient Methoni, uh, centered on the magnificent historical arc created by its many populations. Sarah. Thank you very much for a, a much more generous introduction than I deserve. And thank you all for coming tonight. Kalispera, Efaristan, Puita de Apopse, Ke Yatin Prosohisas, Kesaolus to Sinadelfus, Yatin Sinergasia, Ketinipomonisas. It's an honor to be invited to give a lecture in Coates and Hall and a special privilege to share with you not only some of my own research ideas, but more importantly, the fruits of the collective collaborative synergasia at Ancient Methoni with the effort of Pieria. Finally, we also honor this year, the centennial year of the evacuation of the Christian Greek population from the former Ottoman Empire. This traumatic experience not only emptied Asia Minor and the Black Sea of its Hellenic Romei, but transformed in lasting ways the shape and life of Northern Greece where this project is set. <clears throat> so I hope to address some of these points of convergence tonight. On the personal side, 
I can't help adding that Sasmilao San Americana, de la di apogonos prosfigon apo diaphores chores ethnus kethriskias tis evropis, publica ne kenuria patrida sto exoterico, ke san zizigo elino efstarlo episis jos apodomon apo mikrasia ke anatoliki thraki. My talk tonight begins with Homer. Not only is our earliest work of Greek literature, but is the first Greek poet to confront the burdens of war and defeat on women and children, and the trauma of displacements it forces on captives as well as warriors. As Hector imagines in his final encounter with Andromache in Iliad 6, Troy will fall, and a Greek victor will drag his wife away into slavery. This scenario, echoed in many an Attic tragedy, has inspired multiple modern reenactments familiar to us all in recent years on stage and film, poetry and fiction, composed and performed in inspiration by re refugees from the Balkans, Syria, Africa, and Asia, and other locales rent by war and violence to which I shall return. So to introduce my topic and its setting in Northern Greece, I will begin with Homer's catalog of ships at the end of the second book of the Iliad, an inventory of the Greek cities that sent ships and men to Troy, and an inventory that reaches as far as northern Greece. Um, as you can see, the last sort of purple puddles here on the map uh, cluster around Thessaly. Now, of course, this is a section we all like to skip when we're learning Greek, like reading the begats in the Bible, but let's not forget, it was the roll call of honor for every small community in Greece to hear their place in the great epic of Hellenic heroism, however imaginary and literary, let's face it, this composition. Now, several details are striking about this passage. The seven ships led by Philoctetes represent the smallest group sailing to Troy, as Homer has it. Only the island of Simi is smaller with three ships. It is also the only contingent Homer praises for archery skills, those of the oarsmen, as well as of their leader, who is linked, of course, to a famous legendary bow, as we shall see. Its immediate context is also odd. It's a quartet of mostly Thessalian leaders who are all missing in action at this point in the Iliad. After all, Achilles has withdrawn from battle by Iliad II. Protesilaus was the first to die at Troy, and is, has been replaced by a leader. Philoctetes is quarantined on the island of Limnos, as the poet reminds us right after his formulaic introduction. So really only Eumelus of Thessaly of the four is present at Troy. It's one of the, the prices of introducing your catalog in the seventh year of the war, of course. Let's consider some of these four heroes, and I'd like to begin with Protosilaus. This wounded Roman figure in the Metropolitan Museum of Art may represent him just as he alights from ship to shore and meets his death at Troy, a monument that is also illustrated on classical coins and gems. And I urge you all to appreciate um, an article, a very recent article, perhaps the last one he wrote by the late great much lamented Andy Stewart, uh, which discusses um, Protesilaus uh, in several installations. Now, not all ancient sources have him end his life landing at Troy. Others report that he stepped ashore and slew many Trojans, had his moment of Cleos. Some even tell that he was revived from the dead to rejoin his wife in Thessaly briefly. But in northern Greece, Protesilaus is remembered as the founder of Scione in the Chalkidiki, as you see commemorated on these coins on the right. So a Homeric hero sort of adopted by northern Greek colonists, either on the way to Troy or in the survival of it, a twist on epic reception that introduces us to Methoni and the hero of this part of my talk. Now to remind you of his fate, Philoctetes was seriously wounded on the way to Troy by a, a snake bite on his leg. Some wag on the internet has dubbed this the foot that stalled a thousand ships. Not my joke. <laughs> this wound festered so badly that the Greeks abandoned him on Limnos, en route to Troy. The story of his recovery, uh, or perhaps the recovery of his bow, Odysseus and Neoptolemus fetch him for the sake of his magic bow, given to him by Heracles on the pyre at Eta, seen here on an Attic red figure, Psyctor. 
They need to bring him to Troy, which cannot be captured without the bow of Heracles. The story is well known from Sophocles' tragedy, but where exactly was his Homeric kingdom, including the city of Methoni? If we map the Homeric catalog across Greece, as I showed you before, its four northernmost members are usually located in Thessaly. But recent research, in this map on the right, has pushed Philoctetes and his city north to Methoni in Pieria to be identified with the city in the Iliad. Homer makes this giant leap north, courtesy of Bruno Heli, a historian of Thessaly who argues that Homeric Methoni lies in northern Pieria on the Thermaic Gulf, rather than in Magnesia in Thessaly, which is home to a second Methoni to be discussed in part two. Heli's map gives Philoctetes a narrow coastal strip. You can sort of, whoops, sorry. <clears throat> you can sort of see it. Let me go back. Oh, it's going forward instead of back. Mm, can I go backwards? Uh, thank you. Yes, oh, thank you. <clears throat> it's a very narrow coastal strip. It's kind of shaped that way on an older map, and here it is in Bruno Heli's map. It does give him perhaps the, the oddest shaped kingdom in the Homeric world, although some of us have seen much worse in state voter redistricting <laughs> maps. At least I have. This relocation fits the strategic importance of Methoni as the sole good harbor between about Heraklion near Mount Olympus and Thermi on the Gulf. In fact, Alain Blanc has recently argued that its name, its very name, may derive from Methiemi, that is a verb to release, to let go of the sails, let down the anchor, let go of the rudder, that is a name appropriate to a very welcome harbor. By doing so, <clears throat> by moving him up north, uh, we have also expanded the frontiers of Mycenaean Greece north of Thessaly along with its Homeric heroes. So to venture this far north <clears throat> means opening up a question much debated in recent years. Where is the northern frontier, if we need to use that term, of the Mycenaean world? More specifically, how far north did the Mycenaean palatial system extend? On these two maps, red lines sort of wander from west to east variously. Uh, this one sort of from the islands across up to Mount Olympus. Sometimes they're south of the Peneus River, sometimes they're north of it. Um, <clears throat> it's really up to individual scholars, and it's amplified, of course, by new discoveries. I suspect one obstacle to incorporating it into the Mycenaean world, which you see on a very old and old-fashioned map on the left, orange dots marking all the Homeric sites and Iolkos being the northernmost one. Let's not forget that uh, until 1913, Greece ended just north of Larissa. Uh, so this pink area here was not part of Greece until after 1913. Newly added territories in the 20th century were rarely explored systematically until decades after joining northern Greece, southern Greece politically. And they were also continued to be occupied by foreign forces and preoccupied by internal struggles along ethnic and other lines. Since then, archaeological interest has boomed in northern Greece and has focused generously in particular on rich Hellenistic tombs and Neolithic mounds. Until more recent Bronze Age discoveries, and uh, we should all be grateful to Stelios Andreou and the University of Thessaloniki for all of the new projects around the Thermaic Gulf. <clears throat> These have all expanded to give us a new picture of prehistoric Greece, beginning with the Pagasitic Gulf. Ancient Iolkos, modern Volos, has long, known, been, long been known for its four or now Tholos tombs. It's also ho now home to Megaron buildings and syllabic signs, part of a cluster of Bronze Age sites you see on the lower right that surround the, gul the Pagasitic Gulf. <clears throat> um, and you can see on the left, lower left here, Pegak Pe 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 the site of Pe Pefkakia, which is so important, um, a, a model of the two Megaron. And I help, can't help including um, more by way of amusement, the northernmost find of Mycenaean pictorial pottery uh, happens to be this little um, figure who seems to be an archer on a ship. So we're getting a little closer to the image of Philoctetes, whether this means anything or not. But as soon as you go north of Thessaly, again, 
somewhere around the red line that wanders, um, and especially more particularly north of the Vale of Tempe, which you see here in late autumn. Uh, we see few signs of Mycenaean culture. It's easier to miss them in absentia, that is, massive fortifications, tholos tombs, chamber tombs, palatial centers. Uh, it has so that that still is a, a significant divide uh, for the Mycenaean palatial culture. Now, southern Pieria, and here once again is Methoni to keep you oriented at the north end of Pieria. Southern Pieria around Mount Olympos, thanks to heroic salvage work by the Ephoria under Efi Pulaki Pandarmali and my colleagues at Methoni, it still shows closer connections to Bronze Age palatial Greece, especially to Thessaly. It buries its heroes in, in built tombs, with mounds at times, with swords and seals, luxuries that tend to dwindle out farther north beyond several river boundaries. This is quite different from Western Macedonia, Aeani, and really leading uh, palatial arts flourish farther up the Aliakmon River. However, let's not forget that the name of Pieria is alive and well in Mycenaean Greek, as it appears in several personal and place names attested in Linear B tablets from Mycenae and Pylos that could indicate northern Greece, but let's not forget, the word simply means a rich area. It could be rich in water sources, in lands, in productivity, in other kinds of resources. So perhaps every area in Greece had a place that was named Pieria in the local kingdoms. And let's not forget as well that initial traces of Mycenaean activity in the north survive in shapes like these early Mycenaean cups from Tyrone in the Chalkidiki perhaps signs of southern exploration of northern minerals. It's, it's striking that this phase actually sort of bypasses Thessaly as if people were headed straight to the Chalkidiki for its minerals, even in the shaft grave period. So if Philoctetes had a Bronze Age home up north, it is to be identified with the site of Methoni, located by Greek archeologists decades ago, just north of the village of Nea Agathopolis. Since 2003, the effort of Pieria has explored two adjacent hills, the West Hill and the East Hill, uh, which embrace a, a harbor site, uh, and the eastern part of which has largely been, oh gosh, I've still got this. Can we go back for a minute? I can't seem to go backwards with this. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. One more, Konstantinos. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to show the West Hill, the East Hill. This is the, probably the ancient shoreline traced by this modern road. Beyond that, all this area that is now land is, of course, alluvial fill from the mighty rivers that shed into the Thermaic Gulf. Pella, which will become important later in my talk, is now 28 kilometers from the sea. It was once a port. <clears throat> So I'm pleased to announce, I sort of scooped myself there, the publication of their research in the effort of Prieria in two volumes now out from the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA. Um, shameless plug, I'd be glad to give you a flyer to buy a copy at a discount after the lecture. Um, <clears throat> I will try to acknowledge tonight various contributions to it by members of this audience, both watching and in the room, in the spirit of our Sinegasia project. As some of you know, preliminary results of field research since 2014 have appeared in Hesperia and were presented in 2020 as a film now archived at ASCSA at the website. Now, the story actually begins much older, much earlier than the Bronze Age, for the site of Methoni reaches back to the late Neolithic and finally the Neolithic period on the East Hill uh, where the, site, the settlement must have lasted into the latest Mycenaean phase, and on the West Hill where they buried their dead in a, a whole series between 40 and 50 Bronze Age burials. This is a very important moment in relocation, one of the themes of my lecture tonight, in the sense that after the very rich Neolithic history of inland Greece, there was a serious relocation of many sites. So for example, Makrialos um, Ayasma, the, one of the largest Neolithic sites in Europe, by the way, which is now buried by the highway and the new railway, excavated um, by the effort of Pieria. Uh, this ends its life around the early Bronze Age, just when we, we see some of the first burials uh, on the West Hill at Methoni. And I show you here 
both uh, pottery and contracted burial positions that indicate that we're probably somewhere in the third millennium. So most of the tombs so far uncovered are cut into bedrock and date to the latest Bronze Age, with human remains studied by Sebi Triandafilu and Vaso Papathanasiu, and grave offerings that imitate Mycenaean pottery, as you can see on the screen, next to local handmade types, often much more elegant and much more carefully made. We also find jewelry in bronze, bone, glass, ivory, gold, amber, and carnelian. And this gives Methoni, at the very least, a prehistoric pedigree for Homer's kingdom of Philoctetes, and gives some substance to Helly's argument, which was made coincidentally, uh, completely independently of any of the, uh, this new archeological evidence. But there's one last puzzle that offers an intriguing coda to Bronze Age Methoni. In a fragment of Theopompus cited by Strabo, Agamemnon's shipwrights, whoever nostologoi are, possibly combining the word for ship and for fleet, stolos, they visit Methoni, described as Huleisa, Huleisa is a very poetic and Homeric word, of course, in quest of some supplies, episcavi, some repairs or some construction. Presumably, they're seeking timber for ships since they're associated with Agamemnon's fleet. However, they're turned down by the Methoneans. Katil uh, nasanto dunastai. It's a very difficult text. You can see how much is restored here. So the Methoneans refuse, whether they refuse the Episcavi or they refuse to join the expedition to Troy, which it says here that they are actually recruiting for it, they are unable to oblige. For this refusal, the captains curse them, cut epon, uh, ep epon actually, condemning them to forever keep building their walls. Uh, evidently, the Methoneans' excuse for not providing supplies or for joining the expedition to Troy was that they were busy building their walls. As an anecdote, it fits well a city which even in the time of Theopompus was still fortified with ramparts of mud brick. Now clearly this anecdote, whatever its source, probably one of the Philippica of Theopompus, undermines the Homeric record of a heroic king who joined the fleet with seven ships and provided a weapon critical to the fall of Troy. I suspect it, it must reflect perspectives of the fourth century, perhaps a discussion of Philip's siege of Methoni in 354 BC, the mud brick walls, and why the Methoneans maybe deserve to lose their city. But let's hang on to it for its uh, potential as a prehistoric testament to the early history of the site and for its implication of early timber resources. So if coastal Pieria emerges as a vibrant and active prehistoric landscape between inland Macedonia with its rich Neolithic phases and the emerging connected seas of the Aegean Bronze Age, the next millennium brings us um, the new phase and the second part of my lecture. In Greek history, the first millennium brings us the first formal initiatives by which Greek polis launched satellite settlements throughout the Mediterranean. We call this colonization, but motivations for these overseas ventures vary in both ancient sources and modern interpretations. Thus, Greek historians, ancient and modern, blame economic stress or political conflict at home for emigration, but lately scholars recognize more accurately the role of positive incentives and new opportunities in commodities and exchange, rather than poverty, land hunger, or population pressures for hundreds of excursions that explored new sources of wealth in minerals, agriculture, and manufacturing across the seas. Now, one of these early explorers, and you can see how many cities are still to be identified as colonies of southern Greece and other areas, one early such explorer was the island of Euboea, itself rich in iron and copper, but also home to Greeks who, our sources tell us, traveled the farthest and the first throughout the Mediterranean. Euboean Eretria is remembered as the mother city of Methoni, but its foundation follows a particularly complex set of circumstances. The events that brought Eretrians to northern Greece are narrated by Plutarch to explain the term tines e aposvendoniti, or who are those repulsed by slings. First migrating to a Corinthian colony, Corsaira, a group of Eretrians was expelled from Northwest Greece, then refused re-entry to their mother city. This is often 
a, a subtext of Greek colonial uh, narratives. The right of return is either refused or granted. So they are driven away by, with sling stones by their own fellow citizens, and that, was, that is what makes them aposvendoniti. This echoes, of course, a painful experience if you think of this narrative of, of wandering. That is, they leave Eretria, they go to Corsaira, they're driven back, they're not allowed back, and then they end up in northern Greece. Um, many refugees today can tell much more painful stories about constantly seeking a new home. The irony, of course, about this anecdote, whatever its origin, is that Methoni is later extremely famous for the many lead sling bullets recovered from the siege by Philip II, and we'll revisit them a little later. However, this sort of very pat story may be a later invention and fictionalization of what actually happened, because archaeology, in a sense, upends Plutarch's story, beginning with a Euboean vessel of the late Proto-Geomech period, buried with a warrior and his weapons in a local cemetery. This would be Melissia, north of ancient Methoni and what we'll visit soon, Macedonian Methoni. This, is, this predates the historical origin given by our sources by at least two centuries. So southern interests began early, and they are complemented by the earliest wheel-made ceramic shapes made in northern Greece. A transport amphora, first recognized at Troy, as you see on the left, and now identified as a North Aegean type, with many Thermaic Gulf centers of production for it. Andonis Kotsonas has built a robust model of trade on the distribution of these commodity com containers in northern Greece. And here you can see where all the places that they have been found, if not made, in northern Greece. This would be the background to formal colonies and signs of an enterprise zone, a term we use today, that attracted Phoenicians as well. You see on the right one of the torpedo amphoras found in the Epoyon. So if we use that old model that flag follows finance to Methoni, the minerals of northern Greece may have been a prime attraction, bolstered by trade in natural products that fill these containers, and, let's not forget, Pierian sources of timber for ships. The Eretrians, after all, are oarsmen, etymologically speaking, and they built one of the earliest fleets before the Athenians did. And perhaps it was timber already at this point and its byproducts, think of rosin and pitch, especially also necessary um, for ships, that drew southern Greeks to the north. So beyond this very outdated colonial model, as I say, we have a sort of enterprise zone. And here is what early Iron Age Methoni uh, looks like according to recent excavations. It survives in apsidal buildings on the West Hill, as you see on the left, followed by archaic workshops. The structures on the West Hill on the right include um, three pottery kilns, two recently published, and one in the course of study. Uh, on the East Hill, the prehistoric remains I mentioned earlier of the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age. You see some of the trenches uh, which produced the early material on the peak of the hill. They lie near the later Hippoyon, a deep pit dug into bedrock and never finished or used, but filled with early Iron Age pottery artifacts and debris such as timber, clay, and bricks. This area also revealed some of the earliest stone architecture in Macedonia. In a set of public structures and spaces, you see it here in an aerial photogrammetric view by Hugh Thomas and here in a plan. This set of public structures and spaces was devoted to manufacturing industries in various media and was in constant use until the fall of the city in 354 BC. So this early community supported productive and colorful manufacture, manufacture of objects in clay, bronze, gold, iron, bone and ivory, and glass. Based on the rich evidence from molds in clay and stone, glass rods, the first place they've been found in a Greek context in Greece, working debris in ivory, plus the evidence of crucibles, hearths, and kilns um, dedicated to in situ industries. Most thrilling of all, and most of greatest interest to philologists, are also the early inscriptions found in the Apollyon, uh, and, if, and that have now been displayed and discussed in numerous publications. On the West Hill at Methoni, the early workshops ended in destruction by fire in the middle of the 6th century BC. But classical materials from the Agora, including a very important hoard of Athenian silver coins, 
and the red figure cup on the right, now attributed to the Bond painter by Maria Tolia Christaku. Both of these uh, contexts show that, that life went on until the closing moments in 354 BC and um, that the community thrived uh, in particularly close contact with Athens, alas, for its future fate. For the next phase of disruption in the life of the city arose from its very resources and timber that tied it so closely to Athens. The Pieria Mountains provide some of the finest timber for shipbuilding, specifically Pinos Silvestris for oars, so crucial to the ancient Greek oared warship, the trireme. Methoni's access to this research, resource in the mountains nearby and its function as a harbor site for exporting timbers to the Athenian Navy brought it special privileges within the Delian League. On the right, you see one of the four Methoni decrees, this one in the Acropolis Museum, that spells out special exemptions from tribute, for example, for the Methoneans. This relationship kept it allied to Athens, but hostile to Macedon, which could not tolerate a rival port so close to its own uh, identity. With a view to this map on the left, and to borrow the immortal phrase of Pericles used for the island of Aegina, Methoni became the eyesore of Pella, <laughs> an obstacle to Macedonian maritime ambitions, both commercial and literary. This eventually brought the targeted wrath of Philip II against the city in a lengthy siege, part of his general campaign of over 30 cities destroyed in northern Greece. The campaign won him the city, but cost him his right eye, allegedly from a catapult bolt of the very kind discovered at Methoni in the siege levels, as in this example on the lower left, inscribed with his name. As presented by our Greek co-directors at the 2019 conference in this very hall on the destruction of cities in the ancient Greek world, the siege by Philip left dramatic traces on the West Hill, where a large earth berm against the mud brick city walls and tunnels dug under them revealed the tactical measures of attackers and defenders. A destruction level also covered the buildings and open areas of the East Hill, uh, an important deposit of the mid fourth century now analyzed by Athena Athanasiadu in the forthcoming volumes. Meanwhile, our Sinar Garcia excavations on the West Hill uncovered a second Ipoyon, Pit 46, at least 12 meters deep before we had to stop digging for safety reasons, filled in in several phases, as you can see in the diagram on the upper right. The last one, indeed, material from the destruction of 354 BC. Now, still to be explored are the domestic quarters of archaic and classical Methoni, detected in geomorphological coring and geophysical prospection, as you see on the left. We targeted this plot right here. Uh, for a few shovel trenches, which, uh, which revealed along the ancient shoreline and the presumed harbor, uh, the remains of, of, of the foundations of walls, streets, and houses. So further evidence documenting the life and end of the classical city still lies underground. And here's an aerial view of the, the sort of, of the shovel trenches performed in 2017. Now at other northern cities destroyed by Philip II, the Macedonians installed their own forces at defeated cities and strategic locations. I'm thinking of small coastal garrisons as at Tyrone, border forts, the Caliva at Neohori above the Nestos River in Thrace, or a large mansion or farm site as dominates uh, the, the city at Argilos. At Methoni, Macedonian occupation was long identified by Mantos Besios and his colleagues at a site less than one kilometer from classical Methoni, and there are really blocks and bits of painted plaster. There was quite a, a, a structure there, um, or structures in the post-destruction uh, uh, era. So this site is still lies still lies close to the sea and along the the coastal road, and it's a location now confirmed by surface survey performed in 2014. You can see the concentration of finds in this area, not only in the uh, classic in the starting in the Hellenistic period but in the Roman era. In fact, this, this phase, this uh, sort of revival of Methoni outlasted the Roman period even after the Battle of Pydna. And I'd like to take a moment to urge some of you, all of you, to examine systematically and holistically the various patterns of resettlement in the aftermath of Philip's conquest. There's quite a collection of case studies at different cities. 
It's a special form of strategic urbanism that survives and replaces defeated cities and deserves really its own study. But what happened to its former inhabitants? In the poetic phrase of Diodorus Siculus, they were driven out with, quote, just one cloak on their backs. Their land was redistributed to Macedonians. Research on urban destruction in antiquity focuses largely on sites and dates and remains. We analyze the materials left behind, uh, as we have at Methoni, by those forced to abandon their homes, or in the remains of squatters who occupied a damaged site. Part of Olynthos, for example, was still occupied after the destruction. But tracking survivors of urban annihilation to new homes is more elusive in antiquity than in today's daily news, where we are constantly reminded of it. For example, in antiquity, those expelled from Toroni by the Macedonians continued to call themselves Toronean on tombstones erected long after and very far from home. Now, in the case of Methoni, Bruno Heli has relocated them to Thessaly, where, and you can see here on the map, so from, oops, yikes. Can I go back for a minute? Yeah, thank you. Oh, it just is moving a little too fast. I'm being a little too enthusiastic. There's the arrow. <clears throat> he has relocated them to um, an, a visible site that you've probably all seen. It's a new fortified city simply called Gorica from the Balkan term for that kind of um, fortified hill or city, above, just above and next to modern Volos. You can see it in the background. This site is only really exists from the middle of the fourth century until the end of it. Its inhabitants may be the Magnesian Methoneans, who were mentioned in the Delphic Theodokoi list, but that document predates Philip's siege of the Pierian city by four years. So who were the Magnesian Methonians? Did they come from Methoni? Were they there before Methoni uh, became a formal city? Whoever occupied this prominent hill above the Bay of Iolkos was soon relocated to Demetrius across the bay of the Pagasitic Gulf a new city founded by another Macedonian, of course, Demetrius Poliorkites. So we see another forced migration by enemy leaders with a very short, maybe 50 years, one or two generations of the city in use. Again, it calls for us all to make a close review of these, very, these short term critical episodes in fourth century urbanism. So there's a good MA thesis out there or, or more for one of you or your students. Now, in an AIA paper given several years ago, I proposed a different suggestion. What if the skilled craftsmen among the surviving adults of Methoni and their families were relocated, either forcibly or located themselves voluntarily, to Pella, Philip's growing city that became the largest in Macedonia? So my arrow goes from Methoni north to Pella. And again, this is crossing a body of water as it was still in the fourth century. This idea was inspired by our annual visits to Pella, comparing the following features. And here's a, a view of the edge of the Agora with the colonnade, an air view, and a plan. <clears throat> so what struck me was the resemblance between the public architecture, monumental stone and brick buildings with stoas, public spaces and workshops that you see at Methoni up until 354 BC, and shortly thereafter, the Hellenistic Agora at Pella the chronology is still under study, of course. Again, stone and mud brick structures, colonnades, public spaces, and shops like, um, like this uh, pottery shop that you see uh, reconstructed in the museum. At Methoni, uh, a figurine mold found on the very first day of the surface survey. And on the right, figurine molds from Pella, and of course, molds for mold-made bowls in the Hellenistic period. Finally, in metalworking, you see I show you a crucible from Methoni for, for copper alloy production and one from Pella on display in uh, one of the vitrines in the Pella Museum. And on the lower left, the iron smithing heart we found in situ on the West Hill at Methoni. What I'm asking is whether we can imagine a local version of Horace's famous Graecia capta, whereby Philip coerced, or perhaps Pella attracted, the now homeless Methoneans to participate in the development of his growing royal city. Testing this in the archaeological record would require close synchronization and comparison of the final Methonean workshops and artifacts with the evolving urban fabric and industries of the new and growing satellite of Pella. The lower city at Methoni at present un unexcavated must hold urban sectors to compare to those that predate the Hellenistic period at Pella. 
And thankfully, a new project exploring this very question, the history of urban evolution at Pella is now in progress, co-directed by Bettina Tsigarida and Lisa Nevitt. But meanwhile, to introduce the last part of my lecture, I return to 1922 for modern refugee experiences, as since we cannot really probe farther what happened to the Methoneans. So these experiences involve improvised shelter, such as we found in the archaic, uh, in the uh, area of the Athenian um, Agora, or newly built housing in Kesserani on the left, now recognized, of course, and is a stark district of Athens, or even earlier, Anafiotika on the slopes of the Athenian Acropolis. And I thank previous speakers this year, especially Bruce Clark and David Ricks for inspiring me and introducing me to some of these evidence, some of this evidence and some of these images. The question is one of both architecture, where and how did displaced populations of the past find temporary or permanent refuge, and also one of artifacts. What did they bring? What did they leave behind? What did they lose on the way, and how can we trace them? Here I turn to contemporary archaeology, which relies on oral histories as well as on tracing the pathway of artifacts, the artifacts of loss and displacement, which I discovered in a recent article based on a dissertation by Stephanie Martin. We can also, so you see uh, here, the pathways of some of the migrants who reached the Aegean and moved onward into Europe, different maps highlighting the objects lost, the objects gained, and objects described in, of course, interviews with, with refugees. I also would like to point to something we can follow, the work of my UCLA colleague in archaeology and anthropology, Jason de Leon, who traces the pathways of refugees and migrants to the US along the US-Mexico border, now the site of yet another tragedy in a fire in a migrant facility just on the other side of the border. On the left, I've borrowed another image from one of the earlier lectures this year, um, on the one on Ven the included Venezis, who you see here in a labor brigade. I'm not suggesting that what Philip did with the Methoneans was enforce them into such labor brigades. This is in a time of war. This would have been in a, a context of urbanization. But somewhere behind these stories and suggestions lies a real, um, a real experience. For my final episode tonight, revisits the 100th anniversary of the displacement of a million Orthodox Christians, Romei, from widely dispersed corners of the former Ottoman Empire, again shown on the right um, in the period before, not long before 1922. Many of them from the Black Sea, Eastern Thrace, and Northern Anatolia settled in Northern Greece. So while ancient Methoni has retained its name in the modern village of Methoni, the ancient site itself presently lies closer to and right on the northern edge of the village of Nea Agathupoli, a settlement of refugees from Agathupolis on the Black Sea coast of Thrace. That is, they come from this tiny sort of pink dot right there where it says in the middle of the map, 1913 territory conceded to Bulgaria. A seaside town of Greek speakers under Ottoman rule until the 20th century. It's remembered today in the name Achtopol, Achtopolu in Bulgaria, and lies just 15 kilometers north of its border with Turkey and not far south of Apollonia, Pontica. <clears throat> so here you see um, a map with the location of Apollonia, Pontica, a much better known colony, a Milesian colony, and here is the city that has two names, Avleotuchos, or Agathopolis, both names appear in fourth century coins. <clears throat> this homeland and namesake, as I say, was once an ancient Greek colony, possibly founded by the Athenians or by the Apollonians nearby for shipping timber and mineral, mineral interests, uh, thus very similar in locale and resources to Methoni. It offers us, as I had time to go into this, another promontory site protecting a harbor its archaeological history stretches back to the sixth millennium. It once embraced a Thracian settlement with two place names, as I say, competing with each other in fourth century testimonia, and fortification walls of the Hellenistic through Byzantine periods are still visible today. But its inhabitants, and so here's, uh, once here's the city again. Uh, you can see it in the map on the right. Uh, there you go, uh, on just on the west coast of the Black Sea. Its inhabitants lost their home even prior to 1922, after the Balkan War of 1912, when they were forced to leave the city 
which fell under Bulgarian control. And once again, here with an arrow to show you its location. <clears throat> so even before this happened, uh, some of its Romei em emigrated to a new home in the United States in New Jersey, where they formed the Society of Sons of Agathopolis. And I learned all about this from a website kept by Maria Savides, a descendant of those who emigrated in 1904. So once again, here is the location, south of Burgas, which is probably Pyrgos, uh, and some pictures of Tapatrikamas Palatia, uh, inevitably a Greek school financed by the sons of Agathopolis in New Jersey, and a, a colored impression of those Palatia that sit above the harbor. Uh, here is another picture of sort of Agathopolis as it appeared before 1912, and um, the present view of it uh, in Maria Savidis' website. For those forced out in 1912, their first port of entry was Thessaloniki, a refugee center from which individuals and communities dispersed to new homes in areas of Greece only recently independent of Turkey. Among these, a small autonomous group chose to live at the coastal Scala of Eleftheropoli in northern Pieria, I show you on the left a map of 19, dated 1927 where you can see Methoni, the name. You can see Nea Agathopolis right above it, and the Scala is what attracted them. They were, after all, fishermen and sailors and boat builders uh, from the Black Sea. It also lay right on the railway route, which until it was moved uh, farther west in modern times was their lifeline both north and south. So among this group, and I show you a few scenes of the boats around um, the small harbor, <coughs> uh, so this small autonomous group uh, actually resembled in many ways the ancient Methoneans. They were not only sailors and fishermen, but they were lumber brokers. They supplied the Ottoman navy <laughs> with timber. They supplied Constantinople with, uh, with fuel sources, that is charcoal and things like that. And they also received special privileges from, uh, from the sublime port for this. So like the Methoneans, they enjoyed a very close relationship with um, the Turkish authorities, which of course cost them um, later as, as they became um, targets of the Bulgarian expansion. So there's a striking echo between the ancient and the modern um, Agathopolitans and the Methoneans. The modern community <clears throat> of, of Nea Agathopolis, and especially its silogo, the Agathones, took a keen interest in our project from the first field season, welcoming, welcoming us with refreshments in the field, a nice surprise, our first season, and their continued enthusiasm for our research. We reciprocated with community lectures in the former elementary school and were inspired to give back to the community by way of restoration of the former train station, uh, which was long displaced and gone out of use as the rail line moved farther west in modern times. We donated funds, you see it here in 1951, and at one of the receptions they hosted for us at the train station with the name Nea Agathopolis. So we donated funds for labor and materials to repair the roof, install electricity, replaster the walls and paint the exterior, and, and it was formally inaugurated with the blessing of the priest uh, and uh, the, full, uh, the full trimmings in 2016. We also hired a local artist, whom you see here, the center figure on the lower right, to repaint the sign. Um, local artist Nikos Semedzidis, a poet and painter who has in fact decorated most of the village, if I had time to show you all of his work, with his colorful texts and pictures. Typical of his creative spark is the new sign he dreamed up for the station. Politistikos hyperstathmos, cultural superstation. Ancient Methoni, Nea Agathopolis. And um, I'll, I'll show you here just an example of his work, a vision of the Bay of the Ormos Methonis as it might have attracted the refugees who arrived um, after 1912 and found a place that reminded them of home and also most importantly, allowed them to keep practicing their um, livelihood as sailors, fishermen, and um, lumber brokers and shipbuilders. So <clears throat> I hope to end my lecture, uh, as I say, I, I would like to, uh, to mark the fact that today is the first day that railway traffic, railway travel trains are once again 
traveling from Athens to Thess Thessaloniki. So there is partial restoration of rail travel after suspension for weeks for, for recovery from the tragedy that took 57 lives last month and left many with injuries, both psychological and, and, and physical. I, so I hope you will permit me to end my lecture on a more optimistic note about the legacy of travel by train in northern Greece. Before recent COVID lockdowns and dwindling membership, the restored train station at Nea Agathopoli, which is now rented to the Agathones, hosted weekly gatherings every Wednesday, coffee, conviviality, visitors, uh, and occasionally they also met there to celebrate their festivals. And those of you who've seen the Mathoni film will recognize the clip that I'm about to show in ending my lecture. It's a scene of traditional Thracian dances performed by the local residents, customs that they brought from the Black Sea, from Eastern Thrace. And so I hope with it to restore to us all a happy memory of connections by train in Greece and would like to dedicate tonight's talk to the families and memories of those travelers recently lost. May we, may we all be safe as travelers and migrants to find our way home safely or to new lands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if we start with questions from the floor or questions from the room. Uh, there are many people in this room better qualified to discuss some of these discoveries and finds than I am, but uh, I'll, I'm happy to hear your questions. You can't quite see. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Barbette looks like she has a question. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see. <laughs> Barbette, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you, Sarah, for a fascinating talk. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed the connection at the end that you made between the ancient and the modern. That was fabulous. Um, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit more about this idea of moving people from one city to another. I'm very interested in how that kind of thing might happen and how frequent it might be um, after conquering a city. Because I'm thinking here of, uh, Augustus moving the population to Nicopolis, um, and uh, there's some other examples, I believe, in the Roman period. Uh, do we have other examples in the Greek period and how that plays out? I wish I knew uh, the answer to that question. Um, I know that uh, <clears throat> Pierre de Cree, for example, has worked a lot on the treatment of but more of prisoners and warriors, and the civilian population we have sort of scattered information about it. I mean, as I say, the scenario I suggested for getting from Methoni to Pella, there's, there's absolutely no ancient evidence so far to prove it. We may find a fingerprint on a pot in Methoni that matches one uh, in, in Pella one day. Um, and most of the examples you give are indeed uh, measures of imperial control. They were certainly very heavily practiced by the Ottoman Empire. That's uh, moving Albanians into these into southern the southern Balkans. Um, the Assyrians did it massively, um, actually creating buffer zones in some sense to keep areas that might be sort of cells of resistance empty. So we have better information for that from sort of imperial sources. And the su the the suggestion that I've made about these these sort of temporary installations that the Macedonians left they're, they're re it's really interesting to compare the different examples that we happen to have. I mean, if we could track down every single one of the cities that Demosthenes claims 
was, was nuked by Philip, we might have more of a sense. Um, and I think it's more in you know, personal testimony that trickles in what happened, of course, to the population that moved into the city during the Peloponnesian War. We hear about that more in comedy than in history. Um, and, uh, but if someone else in the audience knows some, some better examples about these forced relocations, um, we, uh, as I say, it, it's not part of Bronze Age warfare where you, you, you know, capture people and sell them or enslave them in your own household. Uh, they're part of booty treatment, really. Um, but as I say, we just have this probably a cliche of a, of, a, of, a, of a statement by Diodorus that they left with a cloak. He said they could only leave with a cloak on their back. He's making a point about the treatment that Philip gave them. But you know, who were the Macedonians who moved in there? They distributed their lands, uh, presumably their agricultural lands, so they must have suddenly turned into Macedonian farms. And as we see borders move, of course, these, these lands become disputed between more than one party. Thank you. I, I was also thinking about Corinth. Um, you know what happens after Mummius destroys Corinth? We're just told he kills all the men and, and sells the women and children into slavery. That's you know a large population. Uh, and uh, the same thing in Epirus. You know where Sulla sacks Epirus and eighty thousand people are sold into slavery. You just wonder if maybe this is another piece of what happens in those kinds of incidents. And, it's, and how do we track migrants? That, that I, I mentioned the example of the Turinian tombstones in, in Athens. Um, I believe that there are Olynthians who are still called that after the fall of Olynthos. And even, uh, curiously, some coinage, maybe one of the numismatists can inform us, um, that outlasts some that's not specifically tied to, to start and top. No, Selene is shaking her head. are destroyed in a paradigmatic and an exemplary way. Mm -hmm. Olynthus was one of them. It should never appear again. And when Cassander um, founded a Cassandrea, he was accused by the old guard, by Antigonus the one eyed, that he's trying to uh, refound Olynthus. And he said, no, out of question, it was not that. Uh, coinage cannot exist without the issuing authority, without the state. So. Right. Philip, what he wanted was to dissolve this state that created all the time problems. And he did the same with Methoni, because as you very well said, Methoni was the door to Macedonia. And Methoni also all the time created problems, and that's why he destroyed it as a toujours, and moved the population to a place, it was never important again, it was sort of you know, people living and working for Macedonians or stuff like this. Um, but we have a lot of examples from Greek history and Persian history of uh, this dislocation. Uh, of the relocation of people, Aegina, the Genetans in Thyrea during the Peloponnesian War, uh, the people of Asini uh, in Messenia. Are the people of Nafplion mm -hmm. in also in Messenia, mm -hmm. uh, Miletus in uh, deep Persia. So, f what Philip did was uh, everybody was doing that. Yeah, yeah. And but so when we can trace them in inscriptions as well as in, it's in difficult sources, to trace yeah. them in inscriptions. Thank it's you. Uh, the Olynthians they are never called Olynthians before the end of the Chalcedian. Like they are called Chalcedians. They are called Olynthians afterwards because there is this. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions that I may have missed? No? Mm -hmm. we, we do have a question online that I could uh, share, and it's from uh, uh, Tony Usabelli, who asks, can you say anything about the size of the refugee population? Uh, you mean the, the Methoneans, the ancient one? <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not articulated, yes. so you can I, choose. I, I, we're, we're talking about a million, I think, who came that came to northern Greece, but more than that in the total population exchange. For, for Methoni, as I say, we because domestic quarters are not been excavated, we don't really have a good sense of the extent or size of the city. We do hear about the forces that were sent to defend it, the 3,000 Athenian hoplites and things like that. So it must have been a considerable size, but it's also the strategic location. But I'm not sure if I answered the question because I'm not sure if we were... Uh, being asked about the um, uh, the ancient or the modern population. Selini, mm. yes. I have a, uh, I, I 
Si je prends la parole tout le temps, but I feel at home uh, um, in the area. Um, that's why. So I have some, um, let's say, remarks and suggestions to make. Thank you very much for the talk, for this very rich talk. So I think that after, um, um, it's uh, without doubt that the uh, methony of Homer is the uh, Magnesian methony. Is the what? Magnesian methony. Oh. Wh which one? You mean in Homer or later? In because Homer, it must be the Magnesian Methony. Uh, uh, and we have also some other examples. You know, there are these cities like Thavmakia that exist in the area, mentioned after Methony in the text. And we have in the same area, not far away, a city named Thavmakoi, also in Achaia of Theotis. We have a Dion in Euboia, and opposite the Dion of Euboia, we have a Dion. Uh, in Edea, in Achaia of Theotis, uh, and also in in mm -hmm. um, in the Acte, in the in the Athos Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, so it and the, the the inscription because I checked the inscription and you are right, it dates from 358 for for many many reasons uh, reveals that we are dealing with such a case. It's interesting because they adopted the same name, but sometimes we have the same name for a of city. Of course, there are four yes. places called Methony in exactly. the ancient world, and and also let's say Ion, who means the the coast, and we have yes. two Ions um, in. Um, uh, trace. Um, uh, this has nothing to do, of course, you showed very well that we have traces of earlier periods in Methone, and the, 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 the colonies, they went all the time to places where everybody wanted to go. The second thing is about Methone, I don't think that the, your, our Methone, the Tracian Methone, the Pierre Methone, had access to timber. Has it's what? Access to timber. It oh, well, uh, you should discuss this with um, Dr. Bufalis across the room. <laughs> yeah, I think and it's so far away, and the inscription, the, the decrees of Methony, do not mention wood. It does not mention timber. No, this timber. is true. It mentions the roads that break to Methony, the, the commodity, the commercial, the trade. Um, mm -hmm. And the third thing is about Arathopolis. Um, it's a very nice story with the refugees that came, but Arathopolis is not an ancient city. Uh, Ken Rixby and I, many year, some, not many years ago anyway, wrote about this. This city is not mentioned in literary sources before the 10th century AD. It's not in Fortiot, it's not in the Periplus, and the coins are not coins of Arathopolis. Rixby has also, um, he shows also how they, they used to, to, to construct the names of cities during this uh, 4th century and the Hellenistic period, and this is not the way. Um, um, so it he might have been has, Avleotiros has, instead, the, yeah, others, the Avlut, other name. But the, the coins with Aratho, are not Arathopolis, they are Agatocles, the son of, um, of Lysimachus. Yeah, the story about it being Athenian colony is, I, I think, even floated in Plutarch, but there's no 5th century evidence for it. No, and no. And until, uh, uh, you say, uh, Stephanos of Byzantium, never seen it, and the Peripli, the Periplus of, various books of, books of Periplus of the Black Sea, they never, they don't have uh, Arathopolis. Mm -hmm. So it's something like uh, Sozopolis, Arathopolis, that was founded, uh, but you know, this, uh, the article of Rixby is written in Epigraphic Anatolica, and my article is in a very obscure first shift about Turkish colleagues, so it's, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> we are sorry for this. <laughs> No, and it's, it is like Sosopolis then, but it's also, it's, what's so interesting is that the, the recent modern town in the Ottoman period ended up having an identity that was so close to that of the Methoneans in antiquity that they were involved with, um, with uh, timber for the fleet. So it's, it's an irresistible connection that we can't make. But yes, I realize that the, the this because it's under a modern city it's also not been systematically excavated so um it that's why it has more than one name in most modern discussions of it thank you yes in the back row yeah. Um, thank you very much for that <clears throat> really inspiring talk. Um, it may be pleasing to know that I am actually doing a PhD um, in population displacements in the classical Greek world, so this is really, really great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just wondering how far we can see the case of Mythoni or how it fits into the broader um, cases of population displacement that um, Philip did himself through Mas in Macedonia. 
And I ask because we have a fragment from Justin that says that lots of populations were being sort of moved around Macedonia. Um, and there was, it's actually quite a very, it's a very emotional uh, fragment that, that Justin puts in there. So I was wondering how sort of this case can be seen in the broader relocations that Philip is doing within Macedonia itself. Thanks. In the fourth century, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there are many cities to consider. Um, and, and as I say, the, we, we have an example of a city with, a, with an annihilation, both in literature and in archaeology. That is, there are no finds after this date. Um, from the destruction level and from the materials in the pit that's now being studied, um, but uh, it, it is it is a it's a system wide issue. This just happens to be one example, but um, you know perhaps John, you want to mention about Tyrone, what happened there. Um, Olenthos, of course, still has a, a certain quarter that is still occupied, but um, I, you know I haven't even started to think about how we would trace this, uh, whether they went back to Thessaly, <laughs> which is where they came from, according to Bruno Helly. That's a, a sort of singular idea. Um, and uh, I, I haven't done a systematic study of that. I just started thinking about it more closely, both in thinking about Pella and whether it absorbed the population. And how, how would you study that? How would you study that? Would you do it through, as I say, I just saw a few resemblances and kind of threw this idea out in an AIA paper. But there may be other ways to look at this, because, because we soon have the development of systematic cities like the foundation of Thessalonica. Um, and something that can be traced, uh, Dion, and eventually Sikion. I believe Yanis Lolas has discussed this in, in looking at the roots of what made the, the, the later sort of development of Sikion. So there are people who have made uh, attempts at this, but it's, it's also pretty far from my area of expertise. It's just something I've started thinking about from being involved with Mathoni. Other questions or areas? Sarah, we do have a couple online, uh, so if I could share um, uh, from Jeffrey Barno, who says, thank you for a, a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, and your use of the catalog of ships suggests that uh, you can rely on it as historical um, pertinence. Could you explain uh, on this or, uh, or qualify with regard to Homer more generally? I guess you, the, the question is the using of Homer as a kind of historical source. Uh, that's why I said right from the beginning, I think the catalog is definitely an imaginary and literary creation. Um, and I think for several hundred years, Homer scholars have been gone back and forth that if, you're, if a city does appear in the Homeric catalog, it must have existed in the Bronze Age. And then just as, uh, just as firmly, you can point to examples where they couldn't possibly have been a city there in the Bronze Age. It just proved irresistible once the, <laughs> this idea of Bruno Helles, which may not work, uh, sort of pushes things farther north. Um, and uh, uh, I have not read Athena Kirk's new book on catalogs. Um, there's also a study of the catalogs in Kesia that's out now. Um, but I think that's where we would start. So I have a longer version of this uh, on the Bronze Age evidence where I go into more about um, the catalogs. But yes, I would certainly agree that uh, once Homeric catalogs were once used, especially the catalog of ships were once used to deploy a sort of definitive geography of Bronze Age Greece. And I don't think any of us as philologists can go there or as archeologists. That's kind of a cop-out answer, but <laughs> Other questions? Well, if, uh, if not, we can uh, uh, join uh, Dr. Morris in a glass of wine downstairs, and thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you all for listening, and your attention, and your questions.